this is the title of my presentation, Medical Assisted Production and Human Rights at the European level. I would like to share with you some concerns and some challenges. Here you have the outline of the presentation. I will make a very short introduction to art. And I would like to link uh, access to reproductive technologies with the human rights system in Europe in some way. Mm -hmm. And this involves to check and study the notion and nature of the marginal appreciation, the national marginal appreciation. I would like to check uh, in a very different way the evolution of the margin. The first stage where the margin was only applied in emergency cases, but right now the European Court of Human Rights is applying the national margin of appreciation, the national margin of discretion, also to personal freedom cases. So we will be able to check how the margin of appreciation is working regarding reproductive care. And finally, I will provide some arguments pro and against a widening of the margin of appreciation. Well, uh, just uh, uh, when I mean uh, mm, medical assisted production and human rights at the European level, I'm not talking about the European Union. As you very well know, the European Union is made of 28 countries. After the Brexit, we will be only 27, but we don't know yet. I'm going to talk to you about the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe is made of the, all the European countries, 47 European countries, even Turkey, even Russia and the only uh, less Belarus, and the main, uh, the main uh, uh, is instrument for the Council of Europe is the European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. It's important to know that the European Court of Human Rights, rights located in Estrasburg, many people confuse the European Court of Human Rights with the European Court of Justice, which is located in Luxembourg, uh, has jurisdiction for applying the European Convention of Human Rights, and it's important also to point out that their rulings are binding for all the member states. So it's a little bit strange that Russian authorities or the Turkish authorities assume the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights. And at the same time, uh, the entitlement to bring proceedings to the court is really wide, since the court may receive applications from any person, NGO, or group of individuals. But at the same time, we have to take into account that the problem of the European Court of Human Rights is that it's a subsidiary remedy. So you have to exhaust domestic remedies in order to bring proceedings to the court. So sometimes the rulings from the European Court of Human Rights are arriving too late for applicants. Well, let's uh, go to our issue. It's uh, evidence that. Uh, uh, art, assisted reproductive technologies, is a very hot topic and a very controversial issue all around the world. We have many different news at the media. For example, 65 years old woman gives birth to quadruplets. And also we have some advertising regarding ova and spermation. How another woman get pregnant? Egg donors are compensated with $8,000. I was told by Hannes yesterday that here in Canada we are developing a regulation in order to know which kind of expenses can be reimbursed, which are the acceptable compensation in order to preserve an altruistic surrogacy and not uh, let it uh, become a commercial surrogacy. So what is clear is that after four, 40 years of art, uh, more than 5 million babies were born are as a result of reproductive technologies. You have here the first, uh, the first test tube baby, this brown. And thanks to IVF, uh, Robert Edwards was awarded with the Nobel Prize for the development of IVF, as I was mentioning before. Well, maybe you know all these kind of different types of art, but in order to better analyze what I'm going to say regarding the human uh, court of human, the, the European Court of Human Rights rulings, we have the difference between artificial insemination that can be homologous when it's used with powders sperm, or heterologous insemination when the sperm is anonymous. <coughs> and the second important technique is in vitro fertilization, IVF, it can be homologous with the own game gametes of the uh, <coughs> couple are used and employed, and heterologous with genetic gametes, well, it could be donated sperm, donated ova, or donated embryo, when there is no uh, biological link between the intended parents and the future baby. At the same time, science is progressing and is challenging law, 
That's because we have new technologies like uh, reception of OVA from partner. It's a type of IVF in which one woman provides her OVA and the other places the uterus. So in this type of reproductive technology, we have two different mothers. We have a biological mother, the one who is providing her OVA, and the gestational mother, the one who is placing her uterus. And at the same time, we have very recent techniques like embryos with DNA from three persons. So in this case, we have two biological fathers and one biological mother. So the new scientific discoveries are challenging a lot uh, in, this, in, in, in the rapid <coughs> care field. And we have also uh, a clear distinction in Europe regarding surrogacy between traditional surrogacy, where the surrogate mother provides her own over. So in this case, it's not only a gestational mother, but a biological mother as well. And the gestational surrogacy, when the surrogate mother is limited to just the pregnancy. Nowadays, in Europe, all the, uh, the surrogacy treatments are just, just gestational. In any case, surrogacy has uh, provoked a rupture between pregnancy and maternity. At the same time, it's allowing uh, offspring in case of homosexual people, and it's also challenging many problems. I cannot uh, analyze this problem, but we could wonder if the donors should be anonymous. There is a very wide debate now, right now in Spain, for example, because in Spain, the sperm donors are anonymous, but many people are claiming for discussing the, uh, the donors just because we have to take into account the best interest of the child. Well, at the same time, I would like to finish my overview regarding the reproductive technologies, making a reference to the PED, the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is rather different than CRISPR-Cas9, as is very well known. In PED, we have a genetic selection of the embryo, so it can be selected for uh, prevention of disease transmission, for example, uh, from the parents to the children, or for therapeutic purposes, in the case of baby medicine. But at the same time, you questions are arising. Should be PGD employed in order to allow sex selection? Of course, not in the point of view, but it's one of the uh, debates that are right now uh, on the table in Europe. And what about enhancements? So this is also taking us to the next slide, because we should difference between PGD and genome editing. We are also talking about CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, by contrast with PDE, in this cas 9 we have a genetic modification, not selection, of the embryo. And there's no problem when, when we're talking about soma somatic uh, cells just affecting the concerning individuals, but this is rather controversial when we're talking about young line because this is going to affect the DNA of descendants. Well, many uh, questions arise, maybe we will be able to discuss further later. Uh, traditional debate between therapy and enhancement, when a reproductive technology is therapy and when is an enhancement, should be allowed or not. Second, is CRISPR-Cas9 a case of eugenic engineering? And finally, are we talking about, uh, when we're talking about CRISPR-Cas9, this is a case that could be qualified as a democratization of genes? Well, I cannot, uh, I promise to be I will make a short presentation, but these are questions that arise <coughs> regarding reproductive technologies. Well, regarding CRISPR Cas9, it's uh, prohibited in most of the American and European countries, only prohibited by guidelines at the social level in China, Japan, and India, and there is an people's regulation in some Latin American countries, Russia, and Greece. But in any case, the science is continuing progressing. We have a recent news. In 2017, the UK has recently allowed CRISPR-Cas9 for the shape proposes. And, as is very well known as well, for the first time, CRISPR-Cas9 has produced two new babies, Lula and Nana. <coughs> so here you have the news, meet Lula and Nana, claiming to be the world's first gene-edited <coughs> children. Uh, a Chinese scientist claims that twins have been born healthy after coming into the world with edited DNA. So in any case, I'm not going to give my personal position to this point right now, but I would claim for some kind of harmonization at the global level, and maybe the International Bioethics Committee would be a good 
uh, platform in order to get <coughs> some kind of a standardization at this point. Well, this is the general uh, overview. Now I'm going to focus on the link between reproductive technologies, or for being more exact, the access to reproductive technologies and human rights at the European level. When I'm talking about European level, of course, I'm linking to the European Convention of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights. And in this regard, it's important to note how the margin of appreciation is working at the European human rights system. Uh, at the very beginning, when the, human right, the European Court of Human Rights was created, there was a very long debate about which should be the review of domestic decisions. There would be two possible options, a full review of any kind of national decision, or maybe a partial review of national decision. This was the final option selected by the European Court of Human Rights, so that the Strasbourg Court invented the concept of the national margin of appreciation, which is a jurisprudential creation that is not embedded in the European Convention of Human Rights that was adopted in 1950. So we can define in an easy way the national margin of appreciation as the possibility for member states uh, to uh, not to fulfill in a complete way their obligations according to the European Convention of Human Rights. The member states are allowed to have certain discretion in order to fulfill their conventional obligation. It's rather funny because the margin of appreciation is not a topic applied by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, <coughs> it's not applied by the International Court of Justice. It's just a European creation in order to allow member states not to apply the European Convention of Human Rights. So <coughs> the next question should be, okay, the national member states cannot apply, are allowed not to apply the European Convention of Human Rights, in which cases could national authorities invoke the margin of appreciation? And I would like to share with you the evolution of the margin of appreciation in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. There was a first wave when the margin of appreciation was only allowed in emergency cases. So in time of war or other public emergency treaty in the United Nation, Article 15 of the European Convention of Human Rights allows member states not to apply the European Convention. You have two uh, clear cases. The first case in the history of the European, Convention, uh, European Court of Human Rights regarding the margin of appreciation was uh, Ireland versus the UK. Ireland claimed a violation of the European Convention of Human Rights by the UK when treating Irish prisoners, but the court said that the national authorities were better placed better position in order to judge such an issue, just because the, the tension was affecting uh, the life of the nation, it was a public emergency case. Okay, this uh, doctrine has been also employed very recently, but rather recently, in the case A and others versus the UK. It was about the preventive detention in the UK, in the UK of suspected al-Qaeda terrorists. In this case, the United Kingdom was allowed not to apply the European Convention of Human Rights that uh, point out, points out a right, uh, several rights regarding the preventive detection. So the legacy of this approach is that when the life of nation is threatening, when there is an emergency case, okay, member states are allowed not to apply the convention. But we have a second wave and the margin of appreciation also is working regarding personal freedom cases. For example, uh, it's a case the European Commission of Human Rights not recognizing <coughs> the same-sex people right to marry. Okay, the court said this is not a case for the European Commission of Human Rights. It depends on the country. Because in such cases, it applies the margin of appreciation. And uh, at the very beginning, this wasn't going to be applied because when the Estesburg Court, the European Commission of Human Rights was adopted, it was supposed to be a train in order to provoke that the rest of European countries, which were not very respectful with human rights, were going to join the most advanced countries. The same with no right of same-sex same people to adopt. Well, let's move to the reproductive field. And it's quite uh, paradoxical to find out that at the very beginning, the European Court of Human Rights considered that the access to reproductive technology was taking part 
of the right to respect for private and family life. Because the right to respect for private and family life, which is recognized in Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, involves the right to start a family. So if the right to start a family can be embedded in the right to respect for public and family life, the refusal to access to reproductive knowledge should be considered as a violation of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. But at the same time, it's important to note that this notion should be subject to the value of appreciation, uh, recognizing a considerable group of value for member states when delicate and ethical questions arise. So I want to share with you that in a second wave, the European Co uh, Court of Human Rights are changing its previous case law in order to recognize a very wide margin of appreciation. This wide margin of appreciation was not recognized at the very beginning, but right now, and I think this is a development of the crisis, the crisis of uh, some kind of urbanization of human rights on our continent, the court is considering that because reproductive care is a very controversial issue, member states should be allowed to have some kind of discretion. So which is the point in order to consider that uh, the member states have uh, room for maneuver? Well, it will depend on the European consensus. According to the court, if there is an identifiable European consensus on any kind of issues, in this case, reproductive rights, then the market of precision will not be allowed. If there is no identifiable European consensus, then the European Court washes its hands in order to recognize that any kind of national solution should be allowed. So, of course, European consensus that look at this uh, frame, legal framework of adding to selected countries, we have many different solutions regarding reproductive technologies in Europe. Uh, idea of insemination, intervention, and donation through legacy. So here is absolutely heterogeneous regarding reproductive care. So I would like to uh, show you how the case law for Nestor's rule has been changing. Because at the very beginning, well, as I was mentioning before, the court considered that the margin of appreciation was overstepped in some specific <coughs> cases. For example, refusal to access to art by prisoners. The UK was refusing the access to art of a prisoner, Dixon, that claimed for artificial insemination. And this refusal was considered by the court against the human rights system according to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. The same regarding the refusal to access to PED for avoiding transmission of disease to offspring and this in the same case was uh, the, the court uh, considered that the money was overstepped when refusing legal recognition of children in case of supremacy abroad. We were commenting yesterday the case of Manson and Lavaz. In this case, since there was a, bio, a biological link with one of the part uh, of the part intended parents, the court concluded that refusing the legal recognition of children when you are trying supremacy abroad is against European human rights system. So in such cases, the national margin appreciation was overstepped by national authorities. But unfortunately, from my point of view, the current trend from the European Court of Human Rights is very different, just because it's considering that the margin has not been overstepped in these cases. And these are real recent cases. For example, what about prohibition of spending on all donations for IVF? It's banned in Austria. But in this case, the court concluded that this is, uh, this is uh, allowed to Austria just because it's, uh, it's uh, uh, inside the market of appreciation. The same regarding the prohibition of embryo donation for scientific research purposes. And the same, this is the last case, this is a rather hard case, mm -hmm. paradiso campanelli, regarding the placement in social services of a child born as a result of the national surrogacy arrangement. I'm going to... Uh, uh, let you know a little bit about these cases in a very fast way. What about the, the first important case where the European Court changed its initial position was 
SK and all this was housed in 2011, and this is the case of two Austrian couples wishing to conceive a child through IVF, but uh, Austrian legislation prohibits the sperm and over donation for IVF. So the court concluded that in this case, uh, Austria uh, should enjoy a very wide margin of appreciation since there is no European consensus in this field. So the question that arises, uh, should human rights be recognized depending on a consensus and one particular moment? But at the same time, it's rather paradoxical because in this case, the court concluded that also legislation had not banned individuals from going abroad for infertility treatment and available in Austria. So in some way, the court was promoting medical tourism, rather than like tourism. And at the same time, I am feeling this is a case of double moral because you are allowing abroad what you are not allowing at home. Okay? The second case that is showing the evolution of the court is the prohibition of on every donation for scientific research purpose. Italian law is banning uh, every donation for scientific uh, research purposes, and the court concluded as well that this was aligned to the national margin of appreciation allowed to member states. And I would like to finish with a very hard case. It's a case regarding placement in social services of a child born as a result of a gestational urology arrangement. Paradisian Campana is the most famous case right now in Europe. It was adopted in 2017. It was the case of a baby that, who had been born in Russia. As a result of a full gestational surrogacy, there was no biological being link between the internal parents and the surrogate mother. Once arrived to Italy, the Italian court decided to remove the child from the parents and to place him under the guardianship of social services. Just because Italy doesn't recognize legal parenthood with children who have been born abroad as a result of surrogacy. So in the first uh, ruling, the court decided in the same way that in Madison and Lavasse, we have to take into account the best interest of the child. Okay, surrogacy is not allowed in Italy, but we have to take into account the best interest of the child. And it concluded that the Italian decision was against the European Convention of Human Rights because it was violated the margin of appreciation in this case. But the case was brought to the Grand Chamber, a second instance in the European Convention of Human Rights, that applied a very uh, uh, expansive uh, uh, way, in a very expansive way, the doctrine of margin of appreciation. In any case, it was too late because when the case was first decided in 2015, the children were, uh, uh, had been adopted in, uh, uh, two years before. Okay? So regarding surrogacy, uh, well, the, the, the goal of my presentation is trying to show how the money of appreciation <coughs> and, uh, in, in reproductive care is working. But regarding the surrogacy, many questions arise. Is there a right to dispose of one's own body? Is there the same debate regarding prostitution or abortion, where you are disposing your own body? And uh, we could also discuss about commercial and altruistic surrogacy and, um, regarding if, if they should be treated in the same way. Well, I will finish with some arguments for a wider margin for member states and arguments against a wider margin for member states. And this is very related to the conception of human rights that we could have before. Arguments for a uh, wider margin. I was discussing this issue with, with John yesterday. Well, it's the typical debate between harmonization and standardization and cultural diversity, okay? But uh, for those who defend uh, a wider margin of appreciation for national states, cultural diversity among uh, doesn't allow a uniform legislation, so regulation of private and ethical issues should be left to the national level. This is one point. Second point for those who defend a wider margin is that reproductive treason is a safety valve so that uh, it can reduce moral conflict and express recognition of others' moral autonomy. Uh, this is a very controversial argument for the community. And finally, in the words of Penance, harmonization could be a wall in ships' platform. These are the three main arguments for those who defend 
a wider margin. There are another arguments against a wider margin. First of all, the broad margin involves <coughs> lack of predictability. I have shown you many different cases regarding reproductive care with many different sources from the European Court of Human Rights. Secondly, at the same time, this special court is using the same concept to reach different solutions. So there's some criticism re regarding its inconsistency. And finally, and maybe this could be a point in order to be discussed, universality from a point of view should involve some minimum common standards. Of course, the, 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 the huge problem is what minimum standards should be. But if we really believe that one of the main uh, ruling principles of any kind of human rights system is the principle of universality, we should explore some kind of harmonization <coughs> in order to ensure a minimum protection for every human being. Finally, <coughs> I think that another important argument against the weather margin of appreciation is that margin of appreciation is provoking reproductive freedom, and this is uh, provoking inequality, reproductive elitism, discrimination and exploitation as well. And at the same time, I think that we should also focus in, in low quality treatments. This is the consequence of the different solution at the national level in Europe. The most important reason in order to uh, go abroad to take reproductive care are different reasons in Italy, in Germany, in France, in the Netherlands. Sorry, in Netherlands. So just concluding, uh, for introducing this issue, we need to find a narrower margin of appreciation as a suitable tool for, first, ensuring an equitable protection of reproductive rights as human rights, if we assume that reproductive rights are human rights, some kind of university should be put in the table, and for avoiding unpredictability and ability of the doctor. <coughs> Secondly, okay, let's assume that the margin of appreciation allowed to member states is depending on the <coughs> European consensus. It's very difficult to assume for me, but in any case, let's assume the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. What's the European consensus? Mm -hmm. Well, in some cases, Protestant work is a legislative trend. In other cases, consensus <coughs> is just a social trend. And at the same time, we don't know which <coughs> percentage of member states in the same direction are needed in order to talk about European consensus in a proper way. So nobody knows what European consensus is. And at the same time, it's rather funny because it's not only European, because the court is mentioning many times other rulings from Canada, from Australia, from the United States. This is so-called, I know that you are not taking part of the Commonwealth right now, but this is so-called a Commonwealth approach in Europe. So there is no clear test to know what European consensus is, and the main consequence is that anybody knows who's going to happen when someone is bringing uh, his or her case to the court. So just finishing, I'm claiming for some kind of standardization. We can discuss which kind of standardization, which kind of harmonization, but uh, I, I, we could propose different solutions, for example, limiting European legislation to a very broad ethical principles. I do agree with John, we were discussing this yesterday. We, we cannot uh, make a regulation, an exhaustive regulation, but at least broad ethical principles. And I also do agree with the recent paper of Colleen and Brian Thomas, because many times we are discussing regarding reproductive care putting the accent on focusing on moral and ethical issues, but we could also put the focus on quality and safety conditions and uh, patient protection, consumer protection, since most of the in most of the cases reproductive care is provided in uh, private clinics. And at the same time a possible solution could be promoting self regulation with codes of conduct and guidelines at the soft level. This would be a possible legal framework of art in a globalized world with minimum consensus of general principles in the standard of safety and quality, intermediate regulatory <coughs> regimes, and self regulation, and you have many different instruments in order to achieve this. So these are 
three questions. First, I would like to relate this with the current political process in Europe. The inflation of the widening <coughs> of the strengthening of my appreciation is very related uh, to the claim of more sovereignty for national member states. The United Kingdom, for example, is claiming against the power, the power of the European Court of Human Rights and is claiming for a widening of party appreciation and the principle of subsidiarity as well. Second, in some way, this evolution, widening the money of appreciation, can be considered a renationalization of a law and that. And finally, I think that we should explore mechanisms in order to promote further standardization and harmonization, at least at the European level, and why not at the lower level as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, so we're open uh, for uh, question and discussion. Um, I forgot, I apologize uh, to note at the outset that this is actually a, a joint endeavor. Uh, between the Centre for Health and Policy and Ethics, the Centre for Human Rights Research and Education, the Director John Hacker is here, and Shirley Greenberg, Chair for Women in a Legal Profession, uh, and the Director Angela Cameron is here as well. So my apologies, but thank you everybody for pitching in. Um, so, we're away to the races. Um, perhaps if you could just briefly introduce yourself to Joaquin when you ask a question that might be Yeah, John. Uh, I'll give this. Yeah, John Packer, Director of Human Rights Research and Education. So thanks. Uh, you forgot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you weren't listening. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, uh, so one quick uh, point, um, which particularly for the audience, um, uh, the notion of marginal appreciation, in my understanding, is not actually about the non-application of the convention. It is a, because non-application is derogation, and that's governed by Article 15. So it is the application of the convention but uh, in an interpretation which grants this latitude, uh, which means you do actually have to apply the provisions of the convention. It's not you ignore them or suspend them. So, uh, and that, it's not, one could say it's a nuance, but, but uh, we know what derogation is, which is not application. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem here, it seems to me, is that of course the convention was conceived and uh, um, adopted in 1950. And this kind of topic shows us the difficulties of the natural evolution and application of an instrument to things which are not were not conceivable uh, probably at the time. At the time. Uh, so for me, what this begs for is seems not appropriate for uh, a court, and in this case, an unusual court, a strange court, uh, 40, strange. well, forty-seven or whatever the member states, uh, uh, the council with the diversity and the politics around who the judges are and all the rest of that, to be trying to interpret this domain. What we know from practice is that the convention has also been alive to subsequent elaboration through additional protocols, adding provisions, some very normal, like election, uh, sorry, uh, not so surprising, like elections, uh, regarding elections. So would it not be actually timely and, and appropriate and in terms of foreseeability and, and kind of all the thorny issues that this raises to actually pursue elaboration of an additional protocol. I know it's, that requires states to engage and maybe what I would suggest in that regard would be to start, which is often the case, with uh, non-state based um, codes or guidelines. In other words, for uh, so society, academia to get together and start saying, here's a problem, it's recurrent, here are some of the things we need to start looking at, and these would be good practice, and then put it through the Council of Europe system to elaborate the eventual mission program. Would that ultimately be the better way? Because I don't think the court's going to actually help us. Well, this is a very good point. This would be a, a good solution. Why not developing the convention with a specific protocol regarding reproductive care, a very general protocol. But I'm feeling that this is going to be real, rather difficult right now. Just because the last protocol regarding the European Convention of Human Rights was adopted in 2015. And it just amends Article 1 in order to explicitly recognize the marginal appreciation. Mm -hmm. So at the very beginning, the marginal appreciation of the principle of subsidiarity was just applied by the court. 
But because of the crisis of the Europeanization of public policies, the new trend, so better not to touch, mm -hmm. you know, because if you are sitting on the table, of course you are going to amend the protocols, but it's very likely that we are going to be in a worse position than before. This would be a very nice solution, uh, because as you mentioned before, the European Convention of Human Rights was adopted in 1950, after the Second World War, so this was not a topic for the, the, the policy makers at the time. But I see that this is going to be rather difficult. That's why I would bet for uh, maybe self-regulation to be realistic, you know, mm -hmm. and at the same time, at least to develop safety and quality rules in order to provide some kind of protection for the users and consumers. But this would be, from the theoretical point of view, an excellent option, but from the political one, I am rather acceptable. I'm mm here, -hmm. after the faculty member here. Stupid question, I'm sorry. Why are so many of these cases going to the European Court in Strasbourg and not being decided under national human rights laws? Yeah, uh, this is a very good point because it's important to note that the European Convention of Human Rights should be applied by national courts as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, But as a subsidiary remedy, in case that the national judiciary refuse your application, you are entitled to go to Estrasburg. So Estrasburg is, a, is the last instance. It's very different than in the United States and Canada. So when you are recognizing the possibility uh, for bringing your procedure to Estrasburg, you are losing some kind of sovereignty. Because you are recognizing that it's going to be an international court that will apply the human rights system. But this is not a simple question just because for some people it's rather uh, strange that with the same legal framework, national courts are solving the cases in a different way than uh, Estrasburg court. But what's important to note is that Estrasburg is not uh, defending that, for example, surrogacy should not be allowed. What Estrasburg concludes is that this is not a case for an international court and should be decided at the national level just because the national courts are better placed, are better positioned than international courts. I can assume in some cases this argument, but if we assume this argument in, in, the, whole, uh, in, the, in the whole expansion, it's very likely that you are going to provoke that Strasbourg is no longer to decide anything. Mm -hmm. Just because if national courts are always very placed, the system of European protection of human rights is going to be drastically changed. Mm -hmm. Because our system focused not only that national courts should apply the European Convention of Human Rights, but also has a very important feature. In case your application is refused by national courts, you will have a last resort, you have a last application by bringing your procedure, by bringing your application to the European Court of Human Rights. So in all these cases, uh, it's very, very, very uh, typical that national courts are interpreting and applying the European Convention of Human Rights in a different way than, than the European Court. You know? so, so let me say why, why I asked this question. Yeah. One of the limitations of the European Convention of Human Rights is that you can go under Article 8, yeah. as all these cases are. So umbrella provision. Umbrella provision. But the, the convention is missing a right of security of the person. The, the right of security, I think, is Article 6. To 6. To six. No, it's not exactly a right of security. Yeah. It's yeah. very different. It's very, it's, it's, it's deprivation of liberty is what it really is. Yeah. They call it security, mm -hmm. but it's deprivation of liberty. In this country, cases like you outlined would be litigated under Section 7 of our Charter of Rights, mostly, which is the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. It's the last one, the security of the person, that has been most important in recent Supreme Court cases, not on just human reproduction, but on, on medical things or safety things. Um, isn't it the case, though, that although this similar right is missing from the European Convention, that European countries have this right, and many of these cases could have been dealt with 
international law under security of the person in some way? Okay, I know what you mean. Well, it's important to know that, that when there is a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights uh, recognizing the application, accepting the application, the member states have to amend the national legislation. For example, let's imagine the example of Italy. Italy has a very restrictive reproductive legislation. It's from the same year than Canada, 2004. And because of the, uh, the first case I was mentioning before, they had to change the legislation. So the point is that because, as John mentioned before, the European Convention of Human Rights is very, very broad, you have to employ what is so-called in constitutional law, the connectivity approach. So Article 8, this right for private life, is a very umbrella, and you can uh, get whatever you want uh, according to Article 8. For example, I can remember a case in Germany. It was a case of a guy who was 75 years old and get married with a very young lady. So the guy came for Viara treatment, and Viara is not allowed in German law just because it's not free of charge, you have to buy it. And he was claiming for, for public uh, funding of Viara. He won't refuse it, according to German. But look at the, the approach, it was quite, quite fine. The, uh, the year, in, in the first uh, instance, the, the case was not accepted, but we're coming to the federal court. The federal court recognized the right to Viara for such a specific old guy because accessing to Viara free of charge was related to Article 8, because Article 8 also involves private stock of family. And the German court applied the European Convention of Human Rights. Well, it's a little bit, but it's very useful if you wanted to show how the probably all male judges. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for yeah. sure. But what I mean, for this is not a, this is not a representative case. What I mean is that Article 8, mm -hmm. right to private and family life, yeah. embraces mm -hmm. every kind you could imagine before. Yeah. But the current trend of the effect of human rights is trying to restrict mm -hmm. the white umbrella of Article 8. You know, mm -hmm. so it's uh, leading this kind of cases for the national courts. But it's a very good point because for uh, Americans it's very uh, difficult to understand why with the same legal framework there are many different solutions since the European Commission of Human Rights should be applied by every European country. Okay, can I ask a question? Yeah, Maybe just building on what um, John asked you, um, is it, though, your solution to this is to develop um, proposal. Ethical. <laughs> sorry to go to the uh, uh, ethical principles, um, and yet you know, given the uh, heterogeneity of things that are happening in the pace at which things are developing, the technologies are developing, the ethical issues are not resolved. Yeah, of course, um, it's you know very complex. It depends on the topic, but. Um, is it is it possible that 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 what you're calling for is really feasible? I mean, how how would we uh, how would we uh, come to a resolution on these ethical issues? What what do you think those are? Well, like, can you give us an example of perhaps one that you would resolve in particular? Well, yeah. but first of all, I'm not a fan of ethics because I, there are many different <laughs> yeah, what's, what's ethics. Sometimes I'm feeling that ethics is a way for avoiding law, you know? Uh, Christian ethics, uh, utilitarianism ethics, what ethics? For lawyers, it's very difficult to affect that ethics uh, should be a way for solving problems. What I mean? Well, I was talking about broad, broad ethical principles. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's very difficult to agree which are these broad ethical principles, but I'm sure that everyone here in this room, for example, would assume that the human dignity could be an ethical, an ethical principle. Uh, <coughs> quality and safety of patients could be another important ethical principle. Of course, this body of broad ethical principles are not going to solve all the issues that reproductive care is posing, of course not. But at least, I think that we should explore, because otherwise, the 
the consequence is that all this field is under-regulated. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I mean is that, OK, we are not going to agree in anything. So anyone is going to take care about regulation in this field. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a claim for assuming that some kind of regulation should be adopted. I don't know why. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a, the, 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 the final solution. But what is not uh, acceptable to me is just because there is no agreement, yes. any kind of regulations will be adopted, you know? Can I just ask you an um, unrelated question but about Austria? Is the, the ban on. Uh, uh, or, or, or uh, still in place? Donation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Austria are very happy, Austrian legislators are very happy because the court okay. didn't agree with that solution but considered that it wasn't. Uh, 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 allowed by the European Commission of Human Rights. And how does this law actually function? I mean, obviously, people right, well, choose No, yeah. no, but uh, how does it function in terms of, I mean, people donate their sperm at least without having to go to a clinic or anything? Is that, uh, is there individual live living? Yeah, of course, it's living only living. So in, in Austria, for a couple who wants to access to uh, idea, it's not possible. So the only solution for, uh, Austrians going abroad. Well, but you can also just keep your friend in the Turkey case. So is yeah. that, so is that, would that person actually... Well, I think that if you are donating your sperm or over in another country, because of the criminal law is applied only in your territory. So it's criminalized. Yeah, it's criminalized. Oh, yeah. It's criminalized. That's big. Can you say that? Um, I've got a follow-up question, actually, to Colleen's um, first uh, question. So when we're thinking about sort of broad ethical or broad legal principles, I'm wondering to what what do you think the best interest of the child principle can resolve Absolutely. not all of these problems, but some a yeah, good portion of these indeed. cases that wind up for the European Court. Of course it would be for example a very good point. So Rovas is not allowed in most of European countries. Okay. Mm -hmm. But what about if someone is going abroad and is taking his or her child in order to be recognized uh, as a legal parenthood. Mm -hmm. According to this broad legal principle, mm -hmm. the best interest of the child, the mother, uh, this case would be solved. But for example, the best interest of the minor is not a principle according to the European Court of Human Rights because it was not taken into account in Paradis of Campanelli very recently. Mm -hmm. So the margin of appreciation for the court is more important Wow. than the best interest of the child. So the very solution should be, as John suggested before, is developing a protocol with ethical, ethical or at least guidelines. My claim is that because we have not, we have, we, there's no agreement in which kind of regulations should be adopted, maybe regulation at a subtle level, guidelines, but now you, there's nothing. There's nothing. And the most, my, my, my main concern is that there is no point in order to standardize some you know, uh, rules, very broad rules. I'm not talking about uh, impose a surrogacy regulation all around Europe. Mm -hmm. This is uh, much more modest. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie? Hi, I'm Stephanie Parsley. Um, I'm a professor here on a research and reproductive technology. Um, so this actually goes to Colleen and Vanessa's question. I was also thinking about what are these ethical principles and how would you actually define them? And so I think it's interesting because the example of best interest of the child could come into conflict with something like human dignity. You could see someone making a claim and saying, well, okay, this could be in the best, best interest of the child to recognize the parentage. If they go abroad for service and they come back, there will be other people that will say, well, we want to discourage people from going abroad and coming back because this would affect a surrogate's human dignity to be even engaging in this practice. So I think you would have really some competing interests um, and some potential conflict there. Yeah, yeah you have two competing principles, human dignity by, on, the, on one side and the best interest of the child. I think that you have to balance in this case. Yeah. But when balancing, a lot of uh, the best interest of the child. Yeah. Of course, those who defend that uh, legal parenthood should not be recognized argue that by recognizing the child, you are promoting in some way surrogacy. Yeah. Okay, but this is an argument, but I think that in balance of principles, the best of the child, 
which is not guilty at all, so you prefer it. That's my point of view. But in any case, this is rather controversial. Maybe we could uh, list the principles in order to give some instruments and tools for the courts. So the goal of this proposal is not solely the rapid uh, care uh, issues. That this is absolutely impossible, but at least to provide some kind of tools in order to decide such cases. Because otherwise, it's going to be solved by the European Court of Human Rights 50 years later, or maybe by bioethics, by, uh, by the defendants of bioethics, with many different solutions, mm -hmm. at least at European <coughs> Maybe I misunderstood, but I thought the Italian case. Which one? Uh, well, this is the last one. Well, this is the last one. Yeah, that, that the convention did apply, and there was no conflict with the best interest of the child. It's only that the best interest of the child barred a remedy several years later. Yeah. It, doctrinally, they weren't actually in conflict. It was just after the child has been adopted for several years, they're not going to take the child away. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when, when the, the, the Grand Chamber of the Court is deciding, he's deciding according to the state of the case when the application was uh, presented before the court. So the court in this case shouldn't have taken, shouldn't have taken into account that the, the child was adopted. I think that the best interest of the child, <coughs> at least in a theoretical way, was also affected. Mm -hmm. um, can I because otherwise it will be very easy for the member states. Okay, we are going to delay the case, and since the child is going to be adopted, we will be able to invoke that the best interest, interest of the child doesn't apply, just because it's adopted. Right? You know what I mean? It's a tough one. Um, yes, thank you. And then Mark. My name is Jolanda Luzon. I'm a lawyer at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. Um, so my question relates to religious arguments. There was a case in uh, from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Costa Rica, the individual case, yes. Okay. And I, what I understood from the case, and also from friends who actually worked on this case, was that the main argument from Costa Rica for preventing IVF was the fact that if you have multiple embryos, you might just throw a couple away and just keep one to implant in the uterus of the woman. And then they said that it was a violation to the right to life, and it was based on religious arguments. So I was wondering if you had lots of religious arguments that would be similar to these ones in Europe, or if it is something that is not really well, uh, our Kabili case is very famous uh, in the Inter-American uh, uh, Court of Human Rights, but this is not the logic employed by the European uh, Court of Human Rights. So the, 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 the legal thought of the, of, the, of the rulings is, well, I have this case. Is there a, a European consensus, an identifiable European consensus on this matter? Yes, so in this case, I will apply the convention. No, in most of the cases, there is no consensus. In such a case, I cannot solve anything. I have to wash my hands. But what I mean is the religious argument, for instance, like Austria is a very Catholic country. So when they seem to have very strict rules about everything reproductive rights, is it because of the religious part of it? Is it like? Uh, maybe. So, but I mean, but what do they argue before the court? Would they say? We are against it because we have a specific culture, and yeah, this is cultural. why we think that there's yeah, it's, consensus. It's, it's cultural diversity. Uh, okay. What, what I mean, it's cultural not diversity, I, uh, uh, religious uh, diversity, uh, any kind of uh, cultural aspect could be uh, included here. Of course, many uh, European countries are refusing access to rapid technologies because of religious reasons. Of course, but this is not important according to the court. Okay. The court is uh, stating that national courts are better positioned than international courts. So unless there is an identifiable European consensus, this is not going to be an issue for the court. I don't know if this is a human rights position, because the protection <coughs> and recognition of human rights uh, shouldn't depend on the consensus. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you are voting in Nazi Germany, in the 40s of last century, most of people uh, would vote in some way against the human rights system. You know, so this is the inconsistency of the current uh, human rights court position. So the, the main consequence is that it's very difficult right now to show you and to give you 
a case law of the European Court of Human Rights regarding diplomatic care, just because they are leading such cases uh, for the for the national level. Mm -hmm. uh, from a point of view, and I, I, I do defend uh, some kind of European initiation of a law in Sabiki, because I think that the European system of human rights is going to be weaker. Thanks to the European Court of Human Rights, that's finishing. For example, Turkey and Russia has changed lots of political behaviors regarding freedom of speech or right to vote. So the European Court of Human Rights is a history of success. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in the last years, I think there's been a very important change. And it's important also to note that the British pressure has been important because mm -hmm. the Britons are leaving the European Union, but they are staying and remaining at the Council of Europe. So they want a court not so powerful mm -hmm. because they think that national court should have the last word mm -hmm. in such cases. Um, Michael? Michael Wilson. I trained as an economist and I have very little law background. But anyway, about important people. <laughs> <laughs> the, this is why I said The principle of the uh, rights of the child. When does the child start? Is it post conception, post birth? Post conception. And uh, so the meta question is, you know, is, are these, is this idea of these general principles really that much of a help if there's always going to be significant ambiguities in its interpretation? And a couple of examples from what you've gone through, you know, what's in the best interest of a child uh, when it comes to CRISPR kind of uh, editing? And another one that troubled me, I think, or I question is you talked about biology being only the gametes but nothing about the in utero exposure. But uh, there are certainly things that happen to the embryo and then the child that are a function of the in utero exposure that are over and above anything from the, the genetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are also many, many different issues. First of all, I would like to, to make clear that with this exploitation, of course, from my point of view, technologies, not technologies will be allowed. Okay. But as Vanessa and another colleagues wrote in a recent paper, we don't really know what surrogate mothers really think. And I think that further studies should be uh, tracked in order to know. Because we, uh, 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 in the same way that Canada, we don't have any kind of data regarding what, which are the real proposals, which are the real uh, motivation of surrogates in order to to affect uh, mm -hmm. a surrogacy arrangement. Regarding gene and ed 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 editing, well, I have to say that in some way I'm in favor of CRISPR-Cas9 because for me it's very difficult to explain why are you banning something. So the one who is banning something, if human dignity is not affected, if there is no exploitation, has the charge, has the burden of explaining why you should forbid on something which is going to be good for the future day. This is a, a personal position. In any case, uh, this is very controversial. What the, the, the main goal of this ambition is that we should uh, go further in order to promote some kind of uh, agreement, very broad agreement, but at least it would be a very important starting point. But uh, what you are posing is rather controversial. I don't have a solution for this. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Leia, second year law student here at the faculty. Um, you touched on this very briefly during the presentation, um, but I'd like you to elaborate a little bit more on it. You talked about the right to dispose to one's body, but I'd like you to speak a little bit more with regards to like women, um, abortion rights, mm -hmm. and reproductive rights, and with surrogacy more, the altruistic and commercial side of it. Yeah, uh, well, of course, I, I, I couldn't develop that point just to. Well, there's a very important debate right now in the church room, the, the, the scholarship regarding surrogacy. Uh, and I would like to provide my point of view. Uh, one of the things that is strange, that are rather strange to me is that when we are talking about the right of a woman to dispose her own body, this is rather controversial regarding surrogacy. 
but at least in Europe, there's no debate about prostitution, and you are disposing your own body as well. And there's no debate regarding abortion. You have the right to dispose of your own body. So the question that arises, is everyone who that as surrogacy criminals disposing her own body against her will? We don't know. So why should the thought that just uh, for the planning, for the debate, for the discussion, why should we accept prostitution in case we accept it? In case we accept it? And why not accept uh, altruistic surrogacy? That would be a point. For example, in most European countries, altruistic surrogacy is not allowed at all. Because uh, most of the countries think that surrogacy can never be altruistic. By definition. Yeah, I was just going to say, just in relation to the prostitution and surrogacy analogy, it's funny because some people would well, say. Well, it's not a, I mean, a second analogy. Well, just regarding the, the right to dispose of your own body. Well, but actually, often the, that analogy is drawn, so it is quite apt because there's a lot of literature with comparing them, and they would say actually that I thought it was interesting that you said that we look at altruistic surrogacy and prostitution. Prostitution is paid, and surrogacy, normally the argument that would be made there is actually why are we allowing for this, for a woman's using her body as she pleases and being paid for it, and not paid surrogacy? And so it's actually one thing that we thought about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I know we mean and this is rather controversial, no, no. But in any case, uh, I so, so, sorry, Stephanie's asking what your viewpoint is about the difference between commercial and uh, commercial and altruistic services. Well, uh, okay. the main purpose in commercial is that you want is for profit in some way. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about, about altruistic uh, surrogacy, mm -hmm. you are just giving reimbursed all the acceptable expenses. So there is no profit spirit in this way. Uh, for instance, the typical case of a mother who wants to become a surrogate because a daughter cannot conceive by herself. This should be altruistic. So why should we refuse such cases? I know that the line between altruistic and commercial is very, very, it's a red line, you know? Because for example, I think that in many countries that affect Altruistic surrogacy, the, 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 the costs that are reimbursed to the surrogate are really high. So, under the umbrella of an altruistic <coughs> surrogacy, of course, uh, there could be a hidden uh, commercial surrogacy. But I think this is my point. I don't want to provide solutions. What I would like to claim is some kind of reflection in order to have a minimum common standard a minimal regulation. So I think that this kind of debate is in the good direction for this proposal. Uh, so I just to follow up on it, of course the, the, the big debate here because we permit altruistic. Yeah, I know. I know. But it was told are, that you are you have a very basic regulation in order to know which uh, kind of uh, expenses are acceptable in order to be regulated. But I, now I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, let's change the that in Canada you recognize altruistic surrogacy, right? Mm -hmm. And all the cases under the umbrella of altruistic surrogacy are really altruistic? Or in some cases, the, the girls are uh, as, uh, subject to our surrogacy just because they want to earn some money for studies. We're not sure, but anecdotal evidence says that women right. are paid. Yeah. 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 We call it yellow prey. It's the black market, right? And in terms of and in terms of motivation, so the, there are two separate things that can pull apart. So some people are being paid, but in terms of motivations, it's not necessarily the case that people are being paid or doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. Also, some people might be, some people might be, but we need more. We don't more right now. But, but you are, you are, uh, so yeah, yeah, so Angela and yeah, I and Stephanie are starting a study uh -huh. to speaking to surrogates about their uh, which motivation. Which are the results? Mm -hmm. Which are the well, we're just the starting. We're just yeah. starting. So we'll see what they, what these women tell us. That are and how will you collect the information? Oh, no. well, this will work. <laughs> so we're I'm hoping. Concerned. Yeah, we're gonna do qualitative. Yeah, we're gonna do qualitative Speaking interviews back. across the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you heard Stephanie's point that uh, she was saying though that um, 
the fact that someone is paid doesn't mean that they're doing it for the money. Yeah, yeah, they of course. Be, yeah. Of course, it could be absolutely. And there may be. But uh, I'm going to give a, 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 an opposite argument. Maybe you are going to be just compensated for acceptable expenses, and expenses, sorry. But in some cases, let's imagine someone who is has no resources, even though that she's going to be reimbursed of the acceptable expenses, she's going to do it just because she has an economic motivation. Yeah. For example, in Spain, it's very typical when donating all yeah. Many people want to donate, to donate all uh, the donation, the, the commercial donations <coughs> for them. You are only reimbursed of the cost, but many girls are donating over <coughs> just because they want to earn some money. So even though it's altruistic, there is an economic motivation as well. So, so is the motivation itself the problem, or is it the consequences of the motivation? <laughs> so why would we care that someone is motivated by money per se? Isn't it that what we're worried is that they would be doing it well, and, so then, sure. and then harmed? Is that, is that, you you would also be worried if they were doing it altruistically and then harmed, wouldn't you? Do you think that motivation is not important in this case? I, well, I, I think that people put a lot of weight on it, but I wonder really why when you sort of draw the analogy with prostitution as well, right? So people do, women work in the industry, and men work in the industry, they're paid. You know, we but, might not like it, but... Uh, but some, uh, just, just for, for discussing, someone may wonder that if there is an economic motivation, this is in some way a kind of expectation because you have to... Uh, yeah, yeah. Use this. Well, that's a, but then that's an empirical question. So, is, is it actually yeah. exploitation? Yeah. You know, are people really? Um, super low exploitation. You know, they're they're doing things that are dangerous to their health relative to other things that they might be doing, which might also be quite unpleasant. <coughs> to a lot of a lot of jobs that might be available for people might be worse than being a surrogate, and that seems to me to be a matter for personal determination. <coughs> so, if economic motivation is not relevant here. I'm just saying, I'm just oh. asking. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it or well, okay. a lot of... Let's imagine like, nah, that economic motivation is not relevant for this case. So, I if economic motivation is not relevant, commercial surrogacy should be allowed. As a model in Canada, is receded expenses. So, so you have to pay them as a surrogate, you have to pay the money out before you get it back. So you, mm. it's impossible to make, to make much more than what you spent. I see. So you well, but in any case, you produce a receipt for yeah, the maternal yeah, massage yeah, before exactly you get the money. Percent you receive. Mm -hmm. Well, so go that's where we are, but you know, things are evolving. And, and what do you think? Uh, do you have any idea of the future results of your research? Do you have a mm -hmm. preliminary impression? Mm -hmm. And it will also be interesting to see how so these regulations that are being put into place at the end of the year. It'll be interesting to see how they work whether they're effective, um, I think they'll, whether they're constitutional. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's there's still lots of questions in this area. But These regulations have been adopted at the, the provinces level? The or federal, the level. Level. Yeah. federal level. Yeah, federal level. And we do have, like, I think even more than anecdotal evidence at this point about how kind of the receipt model has been working so far. And so far, I think it is really mixed. I think people are, from what I understand from my, my research, I did, I interviewed lawyers who work with certain intended parents. And some people are paying a lump sum ahead of time, and there is some money that's being exchanged for sure. It doesn't quite fit within our, our regulatory model, um, which is the reimbursement expenses after the fact. So a grace is a great zone of money and It's going to end up in court, right? I mean, the constitution, yeah. yes, yeah. for sure. But so th this, this revolution is going to go to the guarantee. I, I mean, but what, according what according to the Supreme Court in the 2010, only if you know... asking surrogates to incriminate themselves by providing oh. the evidence the that they've only been reimbursed for receipts, which is contrary to mm -hmm. the Constitution. Okay. And then the question of, can you actually prohibit paid surrogacy, surrogacy right? right? Because we had a Supreme Court case only a few years ago that found it was unconstitutional to prohibit the operation of a brothel. Yep. So if that's the case, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's slightly different. Slight, 
around the safety and security of the women working in the CS yeah. industry, though, so it's not quite the same as the issue. So, John, I think a final point, and then we're going to... Hi. Uh, it's actually more of just a question of uh, with regard to your proposal, because it strikes me, and I think this discussion gives uh, good evidence that this is a complicated and, and death and thorny issue. Politically, uh, it's clear the court is uh, walking back from its uh, responsibility, I would say, to apply the convention, which, uh, by the way, from other situations I can add, uh, sometimes cases are brought to the court precisely because domestic uh, institutions do not want to settle the question. They're waiting for the court, and the court now is actually demurring, which is really bloody like, useful. Uh, but uh, it's also clear that you know, it seems that the prospect of a pan-European, or I would say any intergovernmental accord on this is some way away. In the meantime, we're left with a market, basically, with all of its, <coughs> including the negative sides of competition on this, tourism and so forth. Mm -hmm. So my question about your proposal, <coughs> is anyone moving on it? Because uh, there are lots of, no, there are lots of fields like this, <coughs> thorny, tricky, complicated, where more and more guidelines are being developed um, by uh, professional associations, um, uh, expert groups simply saying, here's a problem, and this needs to be addressed. And uh, particularly things like rights of the child. The European Convention on Human Rights does not include the uh, best interest of the child uh, as a prescription. And even though all Council of Europe member states are members of the UN, that's not in mechanistically what is applied. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have uh, a kind of décollage anyway uh, in terms of jurisprudence. Why doesn't a group of expert people simply get together and say synthetically, of all that applies, here would be reasonable guidelines on these tricky issues, which can then be used in reference by domestic courts and others, and potentially within courts. Is, is your proposal got any legs on it now, or is it just no, it's an going idea? To be actually, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I would commend it. I think it sounds like a clearly necessary thing. Absolutely.